boy, we've, we've skipped from uh, libertarianism to Stephen Harper. Well, let's go back to libertarianism for a second. Libertarianism doesn't particularly care about reality, doesn't particularly care about reason, doesn't particularly care whether you're self-sacrificial or whether you're pursuing your own happiness. In fact, libertarianism is a movement. It's not a philosophy. And it's a strategy. It's an idea that, hey, you know, there are a lot of people out there who say they like liberty. For whatever reason, they, they like the idea of, of being, you know, free wheels, uh, hippies, or just uh, intellectuals, uh, squares, eccentrics, whatever it may be. They want the right to do their own thing. Okay, fair enough. So do I. But um, not simply because I whim it. Not simply because, hey, you know, if it feels good, do it. The purpose of, of liberty, the purpose of freedom, is, as I was saying, to, to make sure that rationality has a place in the world. Now, historically, what happened, of course, is a lot of this libertarian movement, a good, a good uh, bit of the power behind it, came out of... Um, Ayn Rand's uh, work. Ayn Rand was an author and philosopher. She wrote several well-known and highly read books. Um, the Fountainhead, Atlas Shrugged, uh, and then non-fiction works including The Virtue of Selfishness and Capitalism, The Unknown Ideal. And, and she really uh, is the one who I think in many ways tied together a lot of the philosophy that uh, needed well, that was actually under attack and is still under attack in our universities. That Aristotelian philosophy, that one that believes that, you know, we're, we begin tabula rasa. We don't, uh, we aren't born with all of these ideas, all of the ideas we're ever going to have already in our head. That we have to actually think, apply our logical, rational faculty to actual knowledge about the world. She was very much an Aristotelian. In fact, she would compare herself only with Aristotle when asked if she was comparable to any other philosopher. Um, her real contribution was not only to tie together uh, thousands of years of philosophy into a coherent logical philosophy, but she made an ind she made a contribution of her own. She was, I think, she defined herself this way as someone whose primary contribution was to the field of ethics. And what she effectively said was, what she recognized was that, that uh, what I was saying before, that rationality, if life is your highest value, if, if this life is the only one you've got, and she firmly believed that, and so do I, then happiness, not misery, life, not death, is what you should be pursuing. Your own life, your own happiness. And everybody should do that. Now, she's not saying that everybody should be forced to do that, but everybody should be free to do that, and morally speaking, uh, should tell themselves that that's what they ought to be doing. Um, in any event, the, the sort of the final part of her philosophy, the crowning uh, bit, the, the logical implication of all of her metaphysics and epistemology and ethics, was something called what she, that she called the non-aggression principle. That's pretty simple. That's a pretty simple rule. In fact, it's it's a little bit ambiguous if it's not understood in the context of everything else she said about the nature of reality, about the way in which people uh, gain knowledge of the world, and about the nature of right and wrong, the nature of good and evil, the nature of uh, the nature of vice and virtue. She. Um, she said that in the, the non-aggression uh, principle is effectively one that says, look, there is a proper use of physical force in this world, but it is only defensive. In other words, it's only, physical force is only to be used uh, in reaction to, or rather uh, to ward off or to prevent uh, as well, the use of, uh, or the initiation of coercive physical force. In other words, I'm driving at the same time, so I'm not wording this very well. I guess, um, let me restate it out of the stop sign. She effectively said that the initiation of uh, coercive physical force is wrong, and that the defense against coercive physical force 
defense against the initiation of, the, of, of coercive physical force uh, is right. Now, libertarians said, well, gee, you know, that's more or less like saying, you know, keep your hands to yourself, or your freedom ends at the point of my nose, and there's some, a lot of truth to that. But if you don't understand what coercion is, if you don't, I mean, what is it coercive, for example? Is the following coercive? A man walks up to a poor man, a rich man walks up to a poor man, the poor man says to the rich man, please give me some money so that I can eat. And the rich man says to the poor man, sure, uh, what will you trade me for that money? Will you mow my lawn for me, please? And I will give you a reasonable amount of money, and they, you know, they could agree on that. Um, would it be would it be coercion if the poor man said, no, I don't want to work for the money, just give it to me? Now, if you're a communist, you're probably going to say, yes, that's uh, no, sorry, that's not coercion on the part of the of the poor man. But if the rich man doesn't give the money to the poor man freely as a as some kind of moral duty, well, then um, that's coercion. That all of this wealth of the world belongs to everybody, and that to deny it to the poorest, to the needy, is is um, is wrong. Now, there's nothing nothing in the uh, libertarian code, if you will, the libertarian movement that says that that, what I just talked about, about the the, um, the rich man denying the poor man money when the poor man doesn't want to work for it, there's nothing in libertarianism that says you can't call that coercion. And in fact, you'll find libertarians that consider that coercion, that think, well, you know, need Trump's property rights, need Trump's, uh, Trump's uh, rationality, productivity, need Trump's responsibility. Now, of course, <laughs> Rand took the opposite view. She said, no, need is not a value at all. A person's free, of course, to give money to a person. Um, and, and if that person is a, higher, is a high value in their life, and relative to the, the money or the food, then obviously the rational thing for them to do is to give the money to that person they love or, or value more than the money. Um, because otherwise the person could starve and, and a life without that person would be worse than a life without the $20, let's say. So it's in one's own interest to pursue one's own values, including the values, the people around you who you consider a value. That's a distinction that libertarianism doesn't bother to make. It doesn't want to make. And the reason is, libertarianism is a, an approach that says, let's get together as many people as we possibly can who say they believe in liberty for one reason or another. We don't care if they're, uh, you know, rational uh, egoists or whether they're um, self-sacrificial uh, folks who are obedient to the will of a mystical turnip. Um, we don't care. Um, as long as they say they're in favor of liberty, and as, so as long as they say that, you know, they don't agree with the initiation of force, well then, hey, they're good enough for me. What happens when there's evidence, however flawed it might be, but the best evidence tells you that some country is going to, or some people, are going to uh, drop a bomb in a bank tower in downtown Toronto. Now, some libertarians believe that, well, you have no right to use physical force of d d defensive force, it's not even defensive, until some harm actually occurs, until someone takes some, initiates some uh, course of physical action. But to my mind, that's utter nonsense. You don't wait for someone to drop the bomb before defending. It's too late then. You're dead. Okay? The preemptive strike, the idea of a preemptive strike is the idea of preventing the use or the preventing the initiation of coercive physical force. And the proper understanding of that principle isn't a game of firsties. You know, he did it first, he started it. That's not what Ayn Rand meant by the non-aggression principle. 
but that is what it becomes or can become when you shear, uh, shear away her metaphysics, her epistemology, her ethics, when you shear away her rational uh, egoism, when you shear away her dedication to uh, the idea, her commitment to the idea that reason is man's only means of obtaining knowledge, or when you shear away the idea that this world really is as it appears. Existence exists. It's, life is not a dream, okay? When you shear all that away, then interpreting things like coercion or even initiation becomes extremely difficult in many circumstances. And that's why you see libertarians, libertarian parties, tearing themselves apart over issues like whether or not we should be in Iraq or whether the United States should be in Iraq. They don't have a philosophy, a single philosophy, with which to interpret that non-aggression principle. And yet it was that underlying philosophy, Rand's philosophy, that gave rise to that non-aggression principle. Now you'll notice libertarians, pay, pay attention to this, when you, when you see libertarians talking about the non-aggression principle, they don't call it a principle. They call it an axiom. A self-evident thing. Something that for which there can be no evidence. Okay? Something that can't be proven, it just is. A leaf is. And freedom to a libertarian just is. And they literally invert their entire philosophical hierarchy. They start with this idea that freedom is good and say, and it, and it must exist before anything can be adjudged to be uh, virtuous or vicious, before anything can be judged to be good or evil, it must be done or said or etc. within a free, uncoerced uh, society. But that doesn't explain why. They've completely and utterly missed the point that freedom is the result of, ha of, of, of humankind needing to be able to uh, reason in order to survive. Freedom is, is the idea that a fist is not an argument. And that idea that a fist is not an argument, or that a fist, that force is not right, is a question of ethics, something that precedes the whole idea of how people should deal with one another, or that precedes how government should enforce the law, or whether government should exist, you'll find a lot of anarchists believe, or a lot of libertarians believe, that there ought to be no government, that government, being an agent of force, is always and everywhere using force wrongly, that it's always initiating coercive physical force, again, utter nonsense. Government. Government is a collection of individuals defending life, liberty, liberty, and property. Government is a collection of individuals doing what any individual has the right to do. To use force to prevent being deprived of their property, to prevent being deprived of their life. And as long as government keeps itself on that path, as long as government defends against coercion instead of engaging in it, government is doing that something that's morally right. Whether we call it government or whether we call it just a collection of people, they're doing something that's morally right. It's not, I don't need permission, all right? I don't need permission to prevent somebody uh, from killing you. Unless, of course, it's clear that you want to be killed, I suppose. But if there's a murderer and he's about to shoot you, there's nothing morally requiring me to say, excuse me, sir, but do you mind if I kill the murderer before he kills you? I have a moral right to kill that murderer. Just like I would have a moral right to kill him if he was going to murder me. And government has a moral right to act as well. They don't need my permission. There's no contract. They are just a collection of individuals. Now they're